here. I know what it's like after the lunch, the after lunch ses uh, session, but uh, it might be a little different with the conference at home session. So, um, so yeah, my name is Reinhard Schultz. I'm from South Africa, but I've been working in the Great Plains region for close to six years now. And today I'm going to share with you a little bit of some of the journey and what gets us to this point of talking about the last grasslands and um, it's a bit of a cliffhanger because uh, there's a lot going on and we think about the last of anything we generally aren't really uh, you know excited about that or we're like oh it's the last of this I, I, I should be excited about it so it's that's weird and uh, I'll, 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 I hope you can ponder about that as I go through this talk now to figure out okay so a couple of acknowledgements uh, la our lab mates at UNL. I have to acknowledge the Holland Computing Center who have been pivotal in assisting processing a lot of the data that I'll share with you guys. Sam Fullendorf and Steve Archer were also really uh, instrumental in, in the initial development of these conversations and the National Science Foundation who funds this project. So why grasslands? Um, I, I wrote the title of the slide as why grasslands but the truth is what I really wanted to say was what are we doing on earth and i think we are we couldn't be in an era, an era of greater uncertainty we find ourselves all sitting in a conference at home and not being able to network with one another and um, no matter what we think about whether it's job market stock market anything in the world we just find ourselves in this era of uncertainty and uh, of course our ecological landscapes are no exception to that and in fact they may have been there for some time now and we all just kind of catching up um, and even so, this, this uncertainty frills down into every aspect of what we do. For example, we can't really decide on what a grassland is. We think it's something between 20 and 40% of terrestrial earth within a temperate tropical and subtropical biome. Um, that might not seem too trivial for most of us when we first read it. You know, when I first read it, I thought, cool, yeah, I'll just write that. But the truth is like, but why don't we know exactly how much we have? Uh, that's, that seems to be... It seems to me it's something we should know. Well, after some more digging, we realized that grasslands are in fact the least protected ecosystem in Earth, as a result, the most imperiled and has the least remaining safe operating space. Um, and of course, as a result, we've lost more than 6% endemic species. So there's plenty of cause for concern when it comes to grassland ecosystems. And uh, this talk really hopes to, to shed light on, you know, let it, we should maybe, um, Try and keep grasslands in the conversation more than we, we more than we do, and it's got me thinking a lot about you know our lives that we engage. It's really becoming difficult to separate people from nature. And when I say that out loud, unfortunately, this what comes to my mind is a simple deforestation, and this happens in so many places on Earth that we are aware of and unaware of. And I kind of kick myself and I'm like, why should I be thinking of this? I ought to be thinking of something like this. You know, when I was out having fun with my niece and nephew playing in a, in a river stream in the Cape Fold Mountains. Um, and these kind of wilderness experiences, I know most of us, or probably all of us have had this before. And those are the ones we remember. Those are the ones we want to go back to. Um, but the reality is, because it's so difficult to separate people from nature, our planet approaching 8 billion people in that before we've advanced every aspect of life very much we live longer medicine is better we need places to grow we need to feed people and we influence fire so all of these aspects it's so tough to get a grip on all of them and to think of how they all influence one another of course our climate's changing and it's no secret that the climate changed several times before in our ge geological time scale but the rate at which our climate is changing is certainly faster than it has before. That's the alarming little message here. And, you know, 8 billion people, every one of us are really like taking note of what's going on. We've noticed some extreme wild weather happening and the frequency of these, of these events are, are increasing with time. And again, that's, it, it, you see it on the news during hurricane season and wildfire season. And, you know, um, it's, it's nice that we start talking about this and, Hopefully our curiosity gets really wants us to, to know a bit more about why could this be occurring. But when I, when I switch back to, to thinking about rangelands and why can't we tell you know, how much we have, why do we have something between 20 and 
my mind casts back to a classic Whittaker model in the, from the 1970s. On your vertical axis, he plots temperature. On the horizontal axis, precipitation. And he essentially grouped all the biomes of life. So this is every terrestrial piece of land can fit in this model somewhere. It's a really awesome idea. And um, we, we're working on an idea that improves this. But what stands out the most is grasslands sit in this red sort of oval. And they can occur anywhere between minus 5 degrees and 25, 30 degrees Celsius, and any, anywhere between 500 and 1,500 mils of rainfall. But within that sphere, I've just highlighted about six or seven different ecosystem types. So where rangelands occur, we can sustain a multiple ecosystems. And uh, the ones we're most concerned about are woodlands and savannas. So when I think of rangelands, I think of an open biome you know, beautiful landscape, just walking out. And when I think of what else can occur at that same open biome, if I'm on that same spot, I know it can be something different and it all depends on what we do with it. So on my yellow box, there's a couple of feedback loops with essential processes that maintain an open biome in an open biome state. High fire frequency, flammable vegetation, shade intolerant, fire resistant species. On the right, I have a closed biome state which is essentially the complete opposite of what I just said. No fire, closed canopy, shade and moisture, so low flammability, et cetera. And um, what can cause these systems to switch over the same area are perturbations or disturbances. Who influences these disturbances? It's beyond this conversation. But if we have exceptional dry years followed by frequent fires or a few, we can switch a closed biome to an open biome. And if we have exceptional wet years, followed by uh, absence of fire, we can switch an, an open biome, can switch to a closed biome. So um, if anything you could um, remember from the slide is essentially where we find grasslands or rangelands today, we can find several other ecosystems. And we, uh, what, what, what this boils down to is, we're not really sure what's going on in terms of some of the processes that have led to these biomes being developed and structured. If you think of that classic uh, temperature and precipitation map I showed earlier, we grouped these things based on where they occur in the landscape. But what we didn't realize is that we influence the landscape to such an extent that we don't actually see commonalities in all the processes that shape them. So this is a map showing fire frequency, no, the amount of um, area that, has, that burns per ecoregion within the same biome. It's a temperate grassland, savanna, and shrubland biome. And essentially, we should see everyone being similar, or at least where you are, you should be similar to the regions around you. I think we can have that argument maybe for the Asian part, but for America, we kind of only see the Flint deal standing out as burns a lot and everything else around it doesn't burn as much. So that was kind of, I got my head scratching on that and I thought, well, we note that fire activity is decreasing within the same biome, but um, we realize that fire season is also changing. North America, we tend to burn somewhere between March and April. Most of it's in April, but you can burn up to May as well. Whereas Asia, most folks are burning between July, August, and September. Um, now that has a, actually plays a big role in the fire regime and can influence this uh, open biome to closed biome state. And what it really matters, what, why this is important is if we think of woody cover potential. So if we think of a rangeland area, or, or in fact, any area, on the y-axis, I've got three biomass. You can switch that out to anything you want, density, woody cover. On the, x, on the x-axis, I've got plant moisture. You can also switch that out to rainfall. And the solid line going up sort of linearly towards exponentially is the climate potential for tree biomass or for your response variable. And what we've noticed on every landscape that we've measured is in fact, we have this dotted line, which is always below the climate potential. And it's because consumer control, it's things we do with the land and that's normal. We don't really want everything to be at the climate potential because where would we live? What would we eat? But we need some sort of balance. And we found, we actually proved this in 2017, where we found that areas in the, in the Great Plains can in fact sustain closed canopy of tall forests. And don't, I mean, irrespective of species that grows there, and we know there are trees that occur within the riparian zone, especially on the eastern side. I'm talking all the way to the west. We, we can sustain it. 
um, we, we dug further deeper and we wanted to know what's, what's really going on. And we, what we found is that most areas are conducting, they're doing different things. Everyone's doing, uh, you know, the Flint Hills, for example, receives over 900 mils of rainfall and uh, Edwards Plateau receives just less, uh, less than 800 mils of rainfall, but it has more woody cover and it has more variability than the Flint Hills. And we know the Flint Hills has the most intact fire frequency regime and most other regions in the Great Plains actually doesn't have that. So there are multiple examples we can use. We can think of the central Great Plains where a lot of ag farms are. And that's just, that's, uh, that's it. That's why we have a realized potential and a climatic potential. So the point is that really depending on what we do with our landscape, we can, we can manipulate it to a, for our benefit or to our detriment. So what's at stake if we lose our open biomes? You know, why, why should we care essentially? <laughs> and it, it really boils down to simple things that affects us on a global scale. Uh, ecosystem services that are provided, regulatory services, carbon sequestration, water provision, uh, livelihoods and culture. There are plenty of people, of course, living across these landscapes and uh, multiple habitat, uh, habitat for multiple species, some endangered, some not so much, but um, this is an important ecosystem and it plays a, a role beyond people. So this, what I'm gonna present is some results that we are about getting ready to submit where we isolated 67 ecoregions that were classified as either grassland or a step. And they are highlighted, of course, in this image. And we did a simple study, no complicated math, no complicated models. We just calculated the amount of area, but they had to meet one criteria, a grassland pixel surrounded by eight other grassland pixels. Um, think of the queen's case on a chess, right? And uh, the theory is, the, the more intact a system is, the more resilient it is, or it should be with uh, combating, especially anthropogenically driven change. And all we wanted to do was just calculate how much of, of in any of these ecoregions meets this criteria, how much area. All right, uh, this is what we found. Only seven ecoregions were in fact highly intact. They occurred, they, in, they contained 75% or more. And I listed them at the bottom. In Asia, we had four, uh, they all dark green. Some of them are connected, some of them are not. In Africa, we had one, the Serengeti. And in North America, we have the Wyoming Basin and the Sand Hills. And the Sand Hills, in fact, while it might be ranked four out of all of the, the, the grasslands and steppe, it was actually the second most intact prairie in the world. That's fantastic. This is what they look like. Um, I've only had the privilege to drive through the sand hills. I have not seen any of them else. I need to go. I have a bucket list now. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, I couldn't fit seven on here, but that's what the Mongolian landscape looks like. And we are now building a case to preserve these seven. And we've dug really deep to find out what's going on in each of these landscapes. And we've noticed that there are several world heritage sites. They're home to countless endangered species. Some of them are vulnerable. Some of them uh, are approaching, threatened. And there's, of course, there's several of them that are least concerned. You know, it's, it's not to say that they only maintain, you know, species of concern. They're all integral parts for continental scale migration, both mammals and birds. I, I inserted a, a flyaway picture, but in North America, we have uh, prongo migration, elk migration, dual migration. Uh, mule deer migration occurring in the Wyoming Basin. Uh, we know that uh, the sandals is, is, is essential stopover for many migrating species going south. So there's just a lot of, not only do we have this conservation aspect, but we also have a, a cultural aspect that's a, that is embedded within each of these systems. And it was, we had to then dig further and find out what's the biggest threats to these areas. And I wanted to focus a lot on, on the sand hills. In 2017, we did a study looking at the um, number of land use changes over a 10 year period. And we, we chose a region just between Oklahoma and North Dakota. Um, you know, for, based on the map, you can see most of the changes are occurring in Kansas and North Dakota. But we realized places like the sand hills and the flint hills, in fact, were immune to some of these changes. And that's fantastic. But where we did see change, a lot of the change was only woodland expansion. 
So that was, at the moment, that's our biggest threat to the sand hills. And we know that energy development is also another biggest threat to the sand hills. But I could change this slide to the last grasslands on Earth, and these threats actually would, would um, they actually account for each of these systems that I mentioned. Woodland expansion and energy development in some form, whether it's oil or gas or mining or wind, is one of the biggest threats to these seven systems. So um, we are making a case for each of these seven systems and I will only present the sand hills, but we've, had, we've, we've dug deep and looked at what makes the sand hills special. We know it was, uh, it was it constituted a national landmark in 1984, it actually maintains the largest uh, uh, sand, stabilized sand dune in the Western Hemisphere, and it hosts the deepest part of the world's largest aquifer, or at least one of them. And I know the, the deepest part goes down to about 320 or 340 meters, I, I think. And it's just one section of, this, of the sand hills. I'm not talking the entire sand hills, but we know that a large part of it is occurring. And this is a, an aquifer, of course, that touches about eight states. And we know it's a stronghold for the for the greater Bay of Chicken. I'm almost done. So the concern we should be worried about is um, a lab mate in our, in our lab recently published this paper showing that this, our sand hills could in fact look very different over the next few years. So our biggest concern is that at this moment we have no unified global conservation effort to conserve these landscapes. And a shared vision that we need and does not necessarily refer to protected areas. Those are good, those are useful, but there can be more. Anything that is a shared vision can be beyond protected areas if we as people have that. So I want to leave you with one question. Will we answer the call to conserve these areas? Thank you.